Welcome to Titian to Monet, European paintings from the Joslin Art Museum. I'm Cindy Peterson, Executive Director at the Talma Museum of Art in Roanoke, Virginia. And it is such a pleasure to have this extraordinary collection of 52 masterworks from Italian Renaissance to the French Impressionism. It's a walk through the European art history on that journey. And it's the collection I grew up with in Omaha, Nebraska. I remember as a school child seeing the Renoir, seeing the Monet, being astounded as I stood in front of Titian and Rembrandt. And I hope you will too. It has been a pleasure to share with our community as they have come in from all ages to see these works on view. We're here in front of a piece by the artist called Titian, uh, who was a hugely popular portrait painter during the 1500s from Venice. So Titian was popular for many reasons, uh, but the most prominent of which was the fact that he painted his sitters in an idealized state. So he made them look how they wanted to look, not necessarily how they did look. And with that uh, flattering view of his sitters uh, came great popularity actually across Europe. He adopted painting on canvas much earlier than his peers, in part because it was so much easier to ship from country to country. Uh, so that in itself is really a testament to his widespread popularity. The portrait we have here is one of the finest examples of Titian's portraiture and shows a man from the Cornaro family with the falcon. So we do know for a fact that this is a gentleman from the Cornaro family However, we do not know which member of the family it is, and that is in part because of that flattering view of the sitter. Uh, we can't place the age of the gentleman, so it could be any one of three generations of Cornaro males. Uh, however, we do know for a fact it's from the Cornaro family because the sitter is pictured with a falcon, and the Cornaro family were the largest peregrine falcon breeders in Venice during this time period. So they were quite a wealthy group, and Titian has gone to great lengths to demonstrate that in this painting. So not only do you see the gentleman with the falcon in arm, you also see a dog in the corner of the painting. Uh, it's a little bit tricky to see. He is painted sort of in the darkness. And that just shows the fact that uh, during this time period, people actually hunted with their falcons and then would have the hunting dogs as well uh, with them when they were out uh, outdoors doing that. Uh, you also do see the ornamentation around the arm uh, with the family crest as well. So Titian has gone to great lengths to identify the sitter as a member of the Cornaro family. Now portraiture during this time um, moved away from early portraiture, which was mostly devotional in nature and related back to the church. This was a time period when those were of means or of wealth were commissioning portraiture of themselves and of family members uh, for personal use in the home and to preserve the memory of various generations. We're in front of the portrait of Dirk van Os III, created by Rembrandt van Rijn. Rembrandt was one of the most prominent artists from the Dutch Golden Age, most known for his portraiture that was both honest and revealing. Here he depicts Dirk van Os in his office, and you can see the symbol of the water authority in the right-hand corner of the painting as well as the seal he would have used on all documents sitting on the desk. When this painting first came into the collection of the Joslin Art Museum, it looked a bit different. There was a gold chain that went across the chest of Dirk van Os, as well as the addition of lace to the collar and the sleeves. These additions were later analyzed to determine if they were later additions to the painting, and indeed they were. Those additions had been created after Rembrandt's death and might have been for one of two reasons. The first being that a later family member may have wished to have the painting altered to show their family member in a greater state. Could have also been that the painting had sustained damage over its lifetime and an artist had tried to restore the painting. After the Jocelyn Art Museum made the decision to remove those additional layers of paint, it was determined that this painting was indeed by Rembrandt, as in its original form, it had been attributed to the circle of Rembrandt, a great find for the Joslin Art Museum.
This Still Life of Flowers in a Glass Vase by Maria Van Osterwick is a fabulous example of still life genre painting, which became popular during the early part of the 17th century. Maria Van Osterwick is one of two female artists featured in the Titian to Monet exhibit, and she was very prominent for her time, being commissioned by individuals like King Louis XIV of France, the Holy Roman Emperor Leopold I, and King William III of England. Still lifes that included flowers were particularly popular because the wealthy would have fresh bouquets of flowers in their homes, and if they couldn't have that, then why not have a fabulous painting? Maria Van Osterwijk was particularly well known for her variety of flowers that she would use within the painted bouquets. She would also include flowers in various stages of life, commenting on the mortality of these flowers. In addition, still life paintings were very popular because they were trying to mimic life as closely as possible. So artists were able to really show off their artistic talents in capturing different textures, as well as mimicking the way that uh, the light would reflect off of many different surfaces. Hence why Marie Van Osterwijk would use a glass face in particular in this painting. You might also notice that there are various insects that are also depicted amongst the flowers, most notably the Red Emperor Butterfly, which is featured frequently within Maria Van Osterwijk's paintings. You might also notice a bumblebee and an ant that are also present in the painting. And bumblebees are featured within that immersive experience as they float around the room with the flowers. This frame is actually original to the piece and also has eyelet brackets at the top, which would have held a curtain rod. Now the curtain would have been important for this painting because the curtain would have protected it from the smoke and soot that would have been given off by the tallow candles that were frequently used for the time. But the painting would have also been grandly revealed at various dinner parties and gatherings by the owner, adding a sense of drama to this piece. We're standing in front of Jean-Leon Jerome's Grief of the Pasha. Uh, Jean-Leon Jerome was a French Academy artist, meaning that he worked uh, primarily with the Academy in France, which was gaining popularity during this time period in the late 1800s. And Jerome was very, very well respected and actually traveled extensively as part of his art career uh, to different countries throughout the Middle East, into Turkey, into Asia. And he recorded his journeys through his paintings. So he was really actually demonstrating the world outside of Europe, outside of France, uh, for those who didn't have the means to travel. It was much more difficult to travel during this time period. Uh, this painting here is actually a bit of a pastiche, so it doesn't represent one culture. Um, it's not a realistic painting, if you will, but instead takes several different uh, cultures that he saw throughout his travels and mismatches them up together to create this somewhat surrealist scene. So the palace itself is influenced by a Spanish palace, but the subject of the painting, the Asha and his deceased tiger are actually inspired by a Victor Hugo poem. So the painting illustrates the last stanza of that poem um, really beautifully. Uh, you see the Pasha's poignant sadness as he looks down at the tiger on this beautifully intricately painted rug. Uh, you'll also note that the artist has played with scale throughout the painting. So the candles are obviously oversized um, and not realistically proportioned. Um, and this was sort of an early move or nod towards uh, surrealism in art. Um, um, and that's something common in Jerome's artwork as well, so playing with depth perception and scale. Um, but this is a wonderful piece and very much a model of artwork coming out of France uh, during the late 19th century. We're now looking at Pierre-Auguste Renoir's Young Girls at the Piano, painted in 1889. Uh, it's a wonderful piece uh, depicting Renoir's uh, favored subject matter, which was 
people for the most part um, in interior spaces, both outdoors and inside. Uh, this piece, once again, shows that Impressionist movement and really highlights that loose brushwork uh, that is you know, part of the Impressionist movement, as well as the color palette, which utilized more pastels, soft tones, um, and came straight from paint tubes with the industrialization of the paint um, and the ability to purchase tubes of paint for use, as opposed to artists having to mix their own colors. Uh, Renoir was one of those original Impressionists exhibiting in the 1874 Impressionist show in Paris, along with artists such as Claude Monet, Camille Pissarro, and Eugene Baudin. And while he was originally associated with the Impressionist movement, he later moved away from some of the themes that his peers were focused on. Um, and this piece is an example of that. So while it is painted within the aesthetic of Impressionism, the subject matter does differ from the general themes that you see within the Impressionist movement. So commonly, Impressionist artists did focus on common people, laborers at work, uh, things of that nature. And in this piece, we actually see two young Parisian girls um, in a well-appointed home practicing the piano. So it's not necessarily on theme with the Impressionists and Renoir himself did actually stop classifying himself as an Impressionist painter later in his career. But this does stand as a wonderful visual depiction of Parisian society. Um, it gives us great clues as to what you know young women at this time were focused on and what they were doing and how they dressed. So it's just a really phenomenal piece um, to have on this exhibition as well and very much indicative of Renoir's painterly style. We're standing here in front of a painting by a French artist named Eugène Baudin, and it's truly a phenomenal work depicting a harbor scene in Venice. Baudin was a French artist and was actually part of that initial Impressionist movement exhibiting in the first Impressionist show in 1874. And while he's a remarkable artist in his own right, uh, it's the influence that he had on those around him that is such a wonderful contribution to the Impressionist art movement as we know it. So Baudin actually grew up in a seafaring family. Uh, his father was a ship merchant and he was back and forth on the family's various boats throughout his childhood until the family actually opened opened up a frame store uh, when he was 10 years old, and he began making sketches uh, while he was on the water at a very young age and is actually credited as being the very first outdoor uh, plain air painter. So Boudin uh, you know, had this wonderful career painting these harbor scenes and actually went on to mentor many young artists, the most notable of which was a young Claude Monet. At the age of uh, 16 for Monet, uh, Boudin actually encouraged him to begin painting in plain air or out of doors. And uh, that actually launched Monet's career as one of the best known Impressionist artists of all time. So I do like to actually refer to Baudin as the grandfather of Impressionist art. Uh, he continued to paint these harbor uh, ship scenes throughout the entirety of his career and made his way to Italy uh, when he was in older age and poor health, but so loved painting the outdoor scenes in Venice that he returned uh, twice before his death. This piece was painted in 1895, so towards the end of his career. And you do see many of the hallmarks of Impressionism within the piece. So the loose brush strokes in the sky and the water and that sense of movement that he's managed to capture on the canvas. Claude Monet is one of the most recognizable figures from the Impressionist artistic movement. In The Meadow, painted in 1879, we see some figures traipsing through the tall grass. Those figures will come to life in the immersive experience as they move through the space while the clouds travel throughout the sky. The figures featured in the painting are Claude Monet's second wife, Alice, as well as his two daughters. And they're included within the painting to show the sheer size of the space. Claude Monet would paint from a studio boat, which would include many of his artistic supplies, easel, canvas, and paint tubes, which was a recent invention that allowed artists to become more mobile and paint outside, otherwise known as en plein air. In this case, Monet was floating on the River Seine when he painted the meadow in 1879.